Hello, everyone. Um, I see people are coming in at the call at different times, um, but I'm just going to get the ball rolling um, right at um, 1 o'clock um, to just get everyone to get ready for the um, SNAP Access Partner Call. So, again, thank you all for um, taking your time out right after lunch or maybe during lunch, I don't know, um, to come and talk with us about SNAP and um, things we're seeing on federal, um, say, and local level, and just here to just help you and more in your work and learning more about SNAP. So, um, a few things for today's agenda. Um, so, we're going to first um, going to hear from our Director of Nutrition Advocacy, um, Signe Anderson, with some federal and state legislative updates and SNAP, um, just to get you all um, knowing what's happening um, above, um, up above, and then also going to bring it back down with just talking about some different outreach things that um, I'm doing, what we're doing, and what we're trying to continuously do and SNAP outreach um, with TJC. Then um, there are some reports that I just wanted to just share with you all that relate to SNAP, access, and, and hunger. So just, again, information that can just help you in your work and sharing the information with others. And then I had some events that um, some partners gave me some information on and that we're doing that I just wanted you all to be mindful of. And that's how we want to go about today's call. I do want to note two things before I get everything started. Um, again, all attendees. Um, should be muted, and if your phone is um, not on mute, please, I just again, I always suggest that you just mute yourself when you come in the call. Um, at the end, we'll do ha we'll have some time for questions. Um, either you can put your questions in the question box and the chat box. I'm looking and keeping my eyes up on both. So um, feel free to ask or put questions or comments there. Also, just want to say that the handout, um, at, meaning the slides for this presentation are in the handout section. Um, again, if you're on GoToWebinar and you are listening to my voice right now via the link that I provided, you have to um, go ahead and download those slides. And if you weren't, um, uh, if you're not on it through the link, um, of course, I'll provide the slides afterwards. So without further ado, um, I'm going to, again, uh, allow um, our Director of Nutrition Advocacy to uh, give some insights on the federal and state legislative updates in SNAP. Um, and again, um, feel free to pose any questions in the question box, but if you have like an out loud question about what she's saying, just uh, ask for you to hold that till the end of the call. So here we are. All right. Thank you, Cassandra, and thank you for everyone for joining our call today. Um, I was going to give uh, just a high-level overview of the USDA proposed rule uh, and share a little bit more about why the waivers are important and talk about what we can do. So on February 1st, USDA published a proposed rule on SNAP and the title Requirement for Able-Bodied Adults Without Dependents, um, which is a term we generally try to stay away from. Um, the rule, if adopted, would make changes to SNAP that Congress specifically declined to make in the recently enacted 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, and these proposed changes would decrease state flexibility, it would harm local economies, and would increase hunger. Um, it threatens to block access to food assistance for Tennesseans living in poverty. So just to explain a little more about the threat and maybe just do a quick uh, overview of the SNAP time limits. Um, first of all, the threat, the proposed rule threatens to block food assistance, um, like I said, taking away states' ability to use waivers to exempt individuals from SNAP time limits. Uh, the weavers are important tool to protect food assistance benefits during difficult economic times. Uh, there's really no evidence that eliminating a waiver will increase employment and earnings. Um, in fact, the opposite is true. It will, it'll be harder for Tennesseans to find a job if they are at the same time struggling to eat. So just to, to step back and talk a little bit about the SNAP time limits. So SNAP time limits apply to able-bodied adults without dependents, um, or ABODs, again, a USDA term, who are, are childless adults aged 18 to 49 and are unemployed or underemployed. 
so working less than 20 hours per week. Um, and it's estimated that under this proposed rule, 755,000 SNAP participants across the country um, would lose their benefits. Um, so right now, uh, the state may apply to USDA for waivers from the SNAP time limit restriction every year based on employment data across the state. Um, in Tennessee in 2017, the time limit waivers were used in 86 counties across the state to remove the three-month time limit restriction for individuals um, in, in that 18 to 49 age range. Um, and that means individuals were eligible to stay on SNAP as long as they needed and qualified for the support. Um, Tennessee used the waivers because the state faced low economic stability and in all 86 counties qualified for the waiver um, from those time limits based on the high unemployment numbers. So in 2018, that number of counties that were granted waivers dropped to 16. So from 86 to 16, um, however, over 50 counties still qualified based on high unemployment numbers, the state decided to only apply for 16. Um, and again, this year in 2019, we've dropped again. Some of you may have seen the alert that we sent out um, a couple weeks ago, but the state announced that they had only applied for six counties to be granted the SNAP time limit waivers, um, even though over 40 um, counties would, would qualify for a waiver based on USDA's um, USDA's unemployment uh, uh, qualifications. Um, so SNAP benefits play a critical role uh, in alleviating hunger and food insecurity for over 900,000 Tennesseans each month. Uh, the SNAP benefits provide a substantial boost to, to the economy, delivering over 100 million in spending at grocery stores. Um, so this, we think this is a, a huge problem and there are things that we all can do um, to push back. So on the next slide, um, we have a list of things that that can be done. First of all, we're asking for partners to submit comments. Um, and there's a link to um, the FAC website where they're collecting comments. Um, and we will be having a webinar next week, so please join us for the USDA proposed rule webinar where we'll, we'll go into a little more detail about it and uh, offer a little more guidance on, on the comments. Um, learn more about the USDA proposed rule. We've sent some information out. We're happy to, to share more. Um, we encourage you to ask others to submit comments, especially if you have uh, specific instances or examples where this would uh, create hardship uh, to, to anyone in, within your counties. Um, if you're active on social media, tweet. Um, there are some, there's a sample tweet that we included in this slide. Um, and uh, so these are just a few of the things um, that we can all do. All right, and I'm gonna move over to state legislation. Maybe I'll pause real quick and Cassandra, has anyone texted any questions? All right, so I'm gonna move into state legislation. I just wanted to mention uh, briefly uh, a couple of the bills that we've been monitoring um, and that we plan to push back if either of these move, move forward. Um, so the first is HB 110. It's a workfare bill that was introduced in the House uh, a little while ago, uh, titled Employment Opportunities for Parents. Um, it's an FGA-backed bill uh, that would mandate particip participation in workfare programs for parents with children um, ages six and older, um, and also would impose uh, requirements to older workers ages 50 to 59 who are not working or, um, or participating in employment and training programs. So we find that uh, to be problematic. Um, and then the second bill that we are monitoring is SB 1279. Um, and this one requires um, uh, verification of citizenship for certain public benefits. Um, so that means verification of citizenship or lawful pr presence of, for each applicant 18 years of age or older who applies for parental care um, and WIC. Uh, so this is targeting WIC. Um, and WIC when it's administered by the Department of Health. So uh, that's um, 
obviously will impact women, infants, children, um, and also a bill that we're looking to push back on. So I'm going to pause again and see if there are any questions. So thank you for the question. There was a question that came in over um, over the uh, question box, uh, the chat box. Would that include people with disabilities when it comes to 50 to 59? No, good question, and no, the the exemptions still apply. Um, so this is this is looking um, this is looking to uh, add additional um, time limits to people who are currently exempt. So this is taking away some of the exemptions, um, and disabilities would would still be waived and would still be exempt. All right. Any other questions, either on the SNAP or the WIC? And I'm also happy to talk about these more offline if, if folks want more information or want to know how, how to engage. Right now, we're, we're just monitoring them um, and trying to gather more information to see how much traction they actually have. All right. So the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, to people on the on the call is we've uh, started a series of regional anti-hunger meetings um, where we have uh, joined with partners in the area. Um, for example, in Memphis, we met with the Mid South Food Bank uh, on February 28th uh, to gather partners from across the spectrum to talk about SNAP and the child nutrition programs and uh, talk about ways that we can work together to improve access for, for individuals who qualify um, and address any barriers that are out there and basically network and exchange ideas. Um, our next anti-hunger meeting is uh, in Chattanooga actually next week on March 8th. So if you know of anyone who's interested um, in these um, in the topic that, that we're discussing today on this call um, and that we plan to uh, talk about uh, at that meeting, please share this information. Um, again, the, the goal of the meetings is to talk about anti-hunger issues in, in the community, um, in the region, um, share information, learn, about, le learn more about the programs, um, and discuss how we all can work uh, together to end hunger. Um, and we want to you know, address the common barriers that exist, but we also want to highlight the things that are working really well um, and make sure that that those um, those best practices are being shared um, across the board. Uh, and again, it's a good good opportunity to network and and connect with other people working in this space. Um, in Chattanooga, we are are co-hosting it with the Capital Area Food Bank and the YMCA. Um, so we're really looking forward to, to that. Um, we also have some national par partners coming from CLASP to talk a little bit about uh, national efforts around the USDA proposed rule that I mentioned at the beginning of the call. Um, so happy to share more information about that. And then we will also be sharing uh, future dates and future locations of, of the regional anti-hunger meetings. Thank you, Signe, for all of that information. And again, if you have any questions that, again, are still lingering in your mind, feel free to use the chat box, feel free to use the question box um, with any information that we will convey. And now you're hearing back from me, um, I'm kind of going to touch on SNAP outreach projects and just outreach in general, like messaging, talking, just overall, a lot of stuff can go on outreach. So I just put a lot of things on there, just FYI. But coming up on the next slide here we go so um i'm just going to touch on a few things and i kind of have some images here to kind of allude to some things but first off um if you look at the agenda which i sent to you all before with the meeting invite say i want to talk about older adults and adults with disabilities and i know sometimes just in conversations it may be sometimes hard to deem someone you know an older adult or deem someone a senior, and I was going through the same type of, you know, which word do I use when I was doing the SNAP Access presentation on, which was titled um, 
um, SNAP access for older, um, how to connect older adults and adults with disabilities to SNAP. And just that's a long, a lot, a lot of things to say to, again, represent the individual whom you're wanting to serve. But I kind of have more words for you to say that can help with that messaging, but kind of will give more, you know, agency to the individual if you're talking about, you know, an individual who is over the age of 50 or an individual who is over the age of 60 instead of outright deeming the person as an older adult or deeming them as a senior. Because again, we want to show that this individual, I mean, aging is, I mean, a spectrum. You I mean, some people see, you know, 30 as young. Some people see 20 as young. Some people may see 50 as young. So I always want to think about that just in terms of messaging, in terms of talking to individuals out in the community. And as I know, some individuals um, target um, in, in their work more individuals who are over the age of 50 or over the age of 60. So I just wanted to provide that insight because, again, I was touring with that same thing when I was going through my presentation and how do I give that the individuals who are over the age of 50 that, you know, that say so. And I'm trying to, again, provide them much, much as information as I can. So I just wanted to provide that insight because I was talking to other individuals who tour with it the same way, and I just wanted to provide that insight. Um, going again back with um, older adults and adults with disabilities, I wanted to touch back on the excess medical deduction and just say, like, hello, I, I, I do have a um, flyer that has that specifically says what are SNAP um, deductions. And I'll actually, what the, those deductions are, you can, what you can use, you can use mileage, you can use prescriptions, you can actually use special prescription diets if you can get the, far, the, um, the doctor or maybe someone at the pharmacy to write it off as saying that the doctor prescribed this um, a medication for my client to take. And again, I'm just trying to really emphasize the um, medical deduction because again, for individuals who are over the age of 50 or over the age of 60, and because the net income limit is really what you're trying to get that client to get to that limit so they can be eligible for SNAP, medical expenses, um, because again, from the past presentation I did, we know that a lot of, a lot of older um, individuals may be spending a lot of money on medical expenses as, again, from the last presentation, I was showing that, I mean, prices are continuously, continuously going up, but Social Security, as in the benefit allotments for either SSI or SSDI are not, are not keeping up with the price of living. So, again, just trying to always put that insight in your mind on, again, from, I still toy with the word senior, so a resource said, seniors, so I'm just going to regurgitate and say seniors again, but the average benefit for households with seniors is $99, which is pretty much a good, a, a good amount for someone who may have not nothing from to maybe to even 15 to 99 is a big increase. So also want to put back how you can report somebody's medical um, expenses. And this is just something I talked to caseworkers about, and I'm just going to spread the word on how to just, if you're having somebody who wants to claim a medical expense, they have it right there on their hand, they want to go give it to DHS. DHS has a change report form, and I kind of took a, a screenshot of what the form looks like. And this is like, I just took a short part of the front page. It asks for the case name, who's reporting it, the case number, the date, Social Security. And pretty much all on the front is, that's pretty much all you fill out because everything else is pretty much words. And there's a little bottom part, but this asking you to report on an address change, which again, the change report form is for you to change something in your household. But on the back of the page, there's an earned income, medical expense part. And you can see on the bottom, I think, where it says out-of-pocket medical expenses, you put that household member's name, you put the amount, and you put the provider. I do know that that, that is a very small, small, small space for you to put that information. And just to tell you how I've been able to help clients um, with that and what I heard from the caseworker is sometimes I write a letter on behalf of the client saying these are the client's medical expenses. You write it out um, very much for the client, I mean, for the client and for the caseworker to see because really you just want the caseworker to be able to see the expense, count the expense for the case, and then count it and then be on part of the budget and the client gets the issuance of benefit. But also want to tell you that there's some, some hacks to it. So you really want to state up front, either on this change report form or in your letter, how that client wants to claim that expense. 
some, as you may know, some clients like to prorate what I would say divide that expense up for how many more months are in their certification period. You can talk with the client, see, hey, how many more months, like when did you first apply for SNAP? How many more, like you could do the, ma the math, figure out how many months um, have they been on SNAP, how many more months do they have to go before they have to recertify, and then if they see it more advantageous, they can actually count it for 12 months. So that medical bill that you may see, it can be counted for one month, for another month, if you divide it by however many months were in, was in that certification period. But you also can just count it for one month, and that client can get that one month in benefit, um, whatever, however much you may see them eligible based off that expense, and you just outright tell that to DHS. So if the client in the in the letter you write say I want my, the client would like the expense to be counted for the rest of their certification period, or you can say the client would like the bill counted as a one-time medical expense. And I say one-time medical expense because that's what it outright says in policy, cite, citing it back to the policy, so that can help you allow the client to use the medical expenses. And and also, I did hear from a caseworker, this can also, I'm not sure how much it may uh, be able to help, but the caseworker did tell me that if a client wants to call in the Family Assistance Service Center and report a change that way, that would um, give the, ca the caseworker will have to put in the record to send the client a change report form, which a notice will say, hey, hello, we heard that you want to report a change, here's a form to report the change. And that can be the, another, another follow-up where DHS will send the client an envelope, they send it back to DHS, and that, that is done. But just saying, if you want the form, I have the change report form. I give you the form. You can print it out, take it wherever you would like to go. And, have, and then, like I said, the key parts are either on this change report form or through a letter on how you assist your client. You really want to say to them, count it as a one-time medical expense or count it over the rest of their months in their certification period. Because DHS, if not, if you don't, if the client really wanted to count it for one time medical expense, they will automatically count it for the rest of the certification period. DHS just automatically does that, just automatically does that. That's, again, just full disclosure from the caseworker and I, and I's conversation, and I'm just spreading the word. Um, but let me pause for a second because I kind of got a question, and I think it still relates to this before I go on the other part. Um, um, so what the question is, what have you seen that is most effective when it comes to outreach and getting um, older adults to call back for SNAP application assistance? Um, what have you found to be most, ex I mean, most effective? And I kind of, I kind of hear you, um, ne um, Nestor, um, from this question, um, because I do understand that that, that follow-up um, can be tough, um, especially if a client may not be taking, um, techie savvy. Um, so trying to get that information may be, uh, a, a, um, you know, a lot of work. Um, but right now, Nesta, I kind of want to talk to you a little bit more off offline about that. But just to tell you what I think has been more successful is when I send continuous letters to the, the client's household or their address. Because then, of course, I mean, more, pe more people are traditional in that sense. When, when they see a letter, they see it of it as important. Um, so I would suggest that, but like I said, Nestor, let's talk more because if there's ways that I can help or assist you in, in follow-up or outreach, let let me know because, again, um, so I go through that same thing with my clients, and most times when I send them a letter that that gets it on the road, they, they, and it says, please contact me ASAP, that most times gets to them rather than a call that they may have a voicemail that may be um, full or again, they may not have a voicemail. Um, and I also heard about you said outreach. I do know that some co some coordinators have um, figured out how to get their message out about their work. So like a newspaper ad saying hello, because again, um, the uh, I can't remember what generation it is. But um, again, I want to say individuals over fifty or individuals over sixty most times read the newspaper. So figuring out the things that you know your population reads, maybe some ads in a little, um, I mean, yeah, local no newspapers or even the free ones, figuring out if you can get um, some announcements on there where they read the information rather than going towards a techie, techie source. Um, but that's my two cents, but looking forward to talking to you hopefully more about that. 
Um, also trainings, um, just saying, I, I concluded my SNAP webinar series. Um, uh, yes, what is it? Yeah, it's February still. Just one more, I mean, one less than a day left out of this month. But yes, the webinar series have, has concluded. So I did a, a webinar series on um, hunger and health. I did one on SNAP access. Um, and I actually did one on SNAP time limits for history history wise which again are all on youtube feel free to go find them they should be under tennessee justice center's um tagline those trainings should be up if you can't find it feel free to contact me if you don't have the um, handouts feel free to contact me i'll share it um as much as i can um but i do want to say that the tr i will be coming up with a new webinar series soon but as I'm not doing the webinar series too, I do want to state that I'm still available for on-site training. If you're seeing, again, not, don't see me just being in Middle Tennessee. If you see me coming to Knox County, you see me coming to, you know, West Tennessee, um, please let me know if you're seeing the training interest in SNAP and any type of information. Just again, we're always happy to share what we know. So I'm happy to come out of my, come out of my little shell in Nashville and come out to where you are to give you information. And I can also plan a webinar, an online webinar for the individuals you serve, if that's more easy and more accessible. So I'm always here and just, just use me how you may see, see fit. Um, and I kind of want to go back to the bear survey just to state that um just to it's being to be continued we're still working upon it um again as i know there's different application barriers different recertification barriers and just trying to solidify that through uh, again not perfect but you know encompassing survey so i just want to tell you all that that's still on my it's still on my to-do list it's still part of my work um and i'm going to bring that back hopefully to next call um but just again as a peer update and just again, going back to SNAP Outreach, I wanted to give this its own slide. Um, just again, while we're hearing about the legislative updates and the, um, the threats, I do want to say that the best way to to fight the negative aspects that are coming for safety net programs like SNAP and other um, assistance programs that relate with nutrition or health, sharing experiences about the program and positive experiences is always is always key to again persuade, I will say, and also bring attention to legislators about whether the issues we are seeing on our local levels on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, these are just points that, again, um, that you all may have know of, of what sharing your experiences can do. And I've always talked to clients all the time just saying, like, if it wasn't for you, I don't know how I would have gotten the help. I want more people to hear about you, and I wish more people will come to you. And I, I, I always am so humble when I hear that because I'm like, this client really got a good service and they were very, they, I mean, humbling of themselves to get this service, even though I want more people to get, you know, access to things that they need. But again, just knowing that them touching me was a, was a one part, but again, they can touch someone else through their own story and their own experience and they can help others and they have that power just as much as I. So just also thinking about sharing experiences is actually giving the power back to the client rather than giving the client I me, mean, I mean, I mean, also just thinking about the person who helped giving that, you know, that power and maybe that, you know, oh my gosh, you helped me type of put that talk back onto the client to realize, hey, you can share your story. Hey, you can be the, the reason why something happens as in some power change or something big happens where, oh, a legislative bill doesn't pass. Like the person is the power. So I just want to say that I'm always here to hear people's experiences. I know you are always here to hear people's experiences. But if you always, anytime you feel that someone's experience or story should be shared to a, you know, a legislator or it should be shared to someone up and, you know, in the federal government, as we're hearing about SNAP time limits, or if you thinking their stories should be heard through a comment, please, I'm, I'm also thinking of ideas and also thinking of ways to work with you all to make sure we can get comments um, on this um, SNAP, time limit, um, SNAP time limit proposed rule, how we're dealing with SNAP time limits on a local level. Again, just amplifying the voice of the client with the experience and just making sure change is actually done on our local levels and our national levels through the experience and through the voice of the client, not just, just me in Tennessee Justice Center. Um, and also just want to give you, like I said, some um, national reports and studies on SNAP um, and nutrition. So 
The first article is kind of hard to find, so let me know if you really, 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 really want it, and I'll give it to you. I had I got it from Academia um, Library, so it's it's open, but it's it kind of got to pay like forty dollars for it. So like I said, I can share it with you. I don't mind sharing a study with you, but it's a study by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, they have um, some licensed uh, master of uh, public health individuals and some uh, individual who is a um, has a doctorate. And this study was a qualitative study exploring the psychological um, uh, 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 or social uh, psychosocial um, effects of food insecurity for individuals, and um, it's specifically the academic consequences of food insecurity among um, um, college students. And the background, as in just um, reading some of the highlights of it, the issue is that food insecurity is a growing concern among institutions of higher learning in the United States. And according to um, studies, and including this one, it's bringing up the prevalence and the risk factors of food insecurity and how it is actually affecting students' health and well-being. And the study's objective is, again, to explore the experience of food insecurity among college students. And again, the um, psychosocial health and academic performance that comes from that. They use in-depth qualitative interviews um, with college students. They really have a lot of um, in-depth, they have the in-depth um, statements and quotes from individuals um, highlighting themes of like a theme of stress or food insecurity interfering with a daily life. And then they have a simple quote from a, a, a anonymous student saying what happens when they have that type of theme of that, again, the psycho, psycho um, social effect. Um, it's some information on what um, what the numbers looks like and that most of this information, I mean, the in-depth interviews were done with the school in California, um, which is just deemed as a large school in California in the in this research. But also there's different information in here that alludes to, you know, University of Massachusetts, Boston. It also has some information of University of Alberta and I think um, Edmonton, um, which I think is in um, California. But it's just, again, highlighting, again, the issue and the prevalence um, of this. And again, I feel free, um, feel free to, I'll share this with you. Again, like I said, it's, it's kind of hard to get. So let me know if you really want it because I know you don't want to pay $40 for it. For the survey list, again, that is for your um, further learning objectives and, and you are willing to pay that price. But again, I have the study and again, it's a very in-depth study that really put, brings home into um, college and, um, insecurities. And again, and it doesn't really allude to how SNAP can um, help with that, but I do want to note that SNAP is a program that can help address food insecurities on college campuses. So just thinking about and putting that into your mind um, and thinking of, of your work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then there's the Hunger Free America, which is a um, national, like, um, kind of a policy tank, um, think tank um, organization, um, nonprofit um, that's up in New York. And um, I, if you know about my uh, work as a VISTA, AmeriCorps VISTA, I was AmeriCorps VISTA with Hunger Free America to lead on the work I'm doing at TJC. Um, but again, I want to just allude to this report because um, I was able to bring some information about some technology access um, to nutrition assistance on our state level. But this information is actually coming from a national level. So actually, I, it's so it's over, um, it's over 50 or yeah, 50, it's 50 pages to be exact. And again, the, the information is again, trying to achieve a long term renovation and modernization of, you know, social service, but through the aspect of SNAP and the technology that SNAP offers for, um, for on our state level. And kind of just, I kind of want you really want to read it because it's very aligning to show what kind of technologies we have and what type of ways we can, you know, submit an application or how we can actually, um, dot me, not me, I mean, submit an application, but also follow up on the application. And I kind of, I mean, think Tennessee is pretty much, um, it's ranking. I mean, we're able to use websites to apply for SNAP. Um, you're able to use the phone to screen. If you're not knowledgeable of this, I'm now shouting out to the core of my lungs. You can use 211 um, United Way um, services, um, do SNAP screenings. Um, and if you don't, I think also there's different, the link, uh, the library services in um, Shelby County, 
Um, they do screenings. There's different. Um, there is a screening number, but it's very. It may be subject to subjective to the county and the uh, places where you're serving. So West Tennessee may have a different two on one line, and it may be different for different counties, or it could be like again for I know for Middle Tennessee we have a two on one line through United Way that people can call in and get screened. So it's very sub um, subjective, but objectively individuals could call into a line and get screening. It's just again county by county sometimes gets kind of um, weird. But I also want to note that some individuals in other states can um, resubmit applications um, through, through the website, or they can also use a mobile app to submit applications. So this just, again, I can share this with you. This one is actually free, so I can send this. That report link right there is all for you to, all for you to um, touch on. So, um, and you can touch on it and look at Tennessee, look at Tennessee compared to other states, and just seeing where we can grow in our tech technological approaches to increasing SNAP for all populations. And then again, make sure all populations are savvy um, and are trained to use the resources that can, again, increase their access. Um, and I see some people do are interested in the study. So yes, I will share the study with you. Um, and I also want to state that we were going to have Amy um, come from ARP Foundation on the call, but um, due to unforeseen um, circumstances where um, family, she can't be on the call today. Um, but I will hope to get her on the next call. Um, but I do want to note um, about the uh, Fresh Savings and Fresh, um, Fresh Savings Program because um, we've been talking a bit about it. And I'm just going to put the slide up. But again, I said she's not on the call right now. But I just want to give you all an update about the program. And again, if you have any questions, I will feel free to send you to um, to Amy, and I know she'll feel free to um, share any information with you. But I do want to say that the Fresh Savings Program is um, concluding um, in March. And I don't want to misquote um, the date, um, but I'm going to state this now because now I'm reading the um, language from, from verbatim. So from, so through the Fresh Savings Program, 800,000 people in Mississippi and Tennessee have been able to stretch their grocery budget and purchase more fresh fruits and vegetables. Hundreds of partnerships were developed to support this kind of work. In Tennessee, this, these partnerships included 31 farmers markets, four local retail grocers, 16 Kroger stores, and three health care clinics. Partnerships have included Tennessee Justice Center and state level and county level Department of Human Services, Agriculture and Health Departments, and Triple AD, and innumerable local nonprofit and community based partners, and also support from dozens of incredible volunteers. With the ending of the foundation grant um, from U.S. or United States Department of Education, I mean Ag Agriculture, on March 31st of 2019. The foundation will be entering their sponsorship of the Fresh Savings Program, including Fresh Savings RX. The programs have been highly successful in nearly every community, and many outlets are making plans to secure local funds to, to continue offering a Double Up SNAP program. The foundation will spend the next several months analyzing the evaluation results from the household survey conducted with 1,400 households. Those results will be made available to partners later this year, which again, Tennessee Justice Center is a partner and we will share that information. And again, if you have any further questions, because again, I just read verbatim, please feel free, I'll share the information to contact Amy Cone, a Cone from ARP Foundation. To end off you all, um, I do have some um, upcoming events coming near you. Um, I didn't really get too many uh, events and trainings except for maybe like one or two. So I'm just saying the overall announcement, if you got something going on, let me know. I'm going to share it. Again, share it as much as I can. So I can share a flyer. I can share um, a date. I want it all. So I just from the announcement that I made about if anybody had an event to share with me, this is what I got. So I'm just going to leave um, Legal Aid of Middle Tennessee in the Cumberland is holding um, clinics, which when you think of a clinic, a clinic is something that um, is where they can bring their attorneys in and offer like hands-on, um, direct 
survey's experience and get some intel on what may be going on with a case or figure out what, what can be done. So they're having a RAM clinic at the Meharry Dental School, which is in um, Nashville, Tennessee, on March 9th. They're holding a SNAP clinic on April 13th at the Nashville Food Project, um, which is, again, another organization that deals with food justice here in um, here in the Nashville area. And they actually are providing snacks to clients. So look at that um, and meeting people where they are. And the 14th through 16th of April, the uh, Legal Aid of Middle Tennessee and the Cumberlands is doing a presentation at the Tennessee's Coalition to End Domestic Violence and Sexual Violence. Um, which is their annual conference um, at that time. So again, if you want more information about that, and also I forgot one, the March 9th, right after, which is on a Saturday, they're doing a, um, going to a food distribution um, with the well, and they're doing outreach at Spring Hill um, High School on that same day. Um, I mean, they're, my regard, they're doing food distribution with the well outreach at Spring Hill High School on um, the night, nine to one. And as Sydney noted, um, the Tennessee Justice Center is doing our Southeast It's a Hunger Summit meeting at downtown um, YMCA. There's the address in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And this is Southeast um, It's a Hunger meeting. Um, so I have counties like Polk, Marion, um, Sequatchie. Um, I, that we are, again, if you're knowing anybody who may be interested in those areas to come, um, please contact me. And then again, events for trains coming near you, email me. But other than that, I want to thank you all for participating in today's call. Uh, feel free to contact us. That's our main contact line. Again, don't uh, get, don't forget we got one more part of our team, our child nutrition advocate. So if you're seeing some stuff that you want to address with um, child hunger in, let's say, in the schools or anything like that, feel free to contact Madison also. But again, if you need some information on SNAP, um, high-level nutrition advocacy, and also how to, you know, get into our webinar or how to get on in that comment, uh, public comment period, feel free to contact um, her, again, or anyone that's on our team. But other than that, I don't see any other questions, um, and I don't see um, anything else to cover. So, again, I appreciate you all being on a call with me, and other than that, I don't have anything else. So take care. Oh, I have one, have one. Hold on. Okay, I see. I just seen someone had a need for the survey. I got got it, got it. So, um, and I'm assuming you're meaning the survey info. Um, I'm thinking maybe for fresh savings, or if you want an information survey, or do you want probably got to email me for more emphasis. But I think you're talking about the um, ARP. So, um, let me know if I can help you in any other thing. But other than that, I will end today's call. So take care, you all, um, and talk soon. Let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah.